of Iquame, America's newest national monument, a biologically diverse land that connects public lands on the east and the west, and a sacred creation site for Yunnan-speaking Native Americans. And what's incredible is that this is only an hour or so away from Las Vegas. Now, we're going to hike to ancient Joshua trees. I'm going to show you how to find petroglyphs. So we'll go into the high mountains and get a great view of the uh, highest point here called Spirit Mountain. All of these hikes I'm going to show you are doable by almost all levels of hiker. I'll show you how to do it. I'll give you some tips so that you can come and visit and experience this magical place for yourself. You can find Viquame south of Las Vegas, wedged between the Colorado River in the east and in the west, the border of California and Mojave National Preserve. The first hike I'm going to show you is in the We Thump Joshua Tree Wilderness in the northwest part of the monument. The hike isn't too long. It's about seven miles out and back, but you can really just hike as far as you want and then turn around and go back to the beginning. You're going to be able to see all kinds of Joshua trees, and it's really about just being there and experiencing it. The drive to the trailhead is pretty spectacular. The road is called the Joshua Tree Highway, and as you drive, you will be surrounded by more Joshua trees than you've probably ever seen in your life. This is a small parking area, but I've never seen, uh, I've never actually seen anyone else here, so I won't worry about being full. We Thump, in case you're wondering, is the Paiute word for ancient ones, referring to the Joshua trees, some of which are over 700 years old. To start the hike, we're just gonna go through the fence. You can see there's a trail sign here. That's about it in terms of signage. There's a couple more posts up ahead, but we're going to go straight back from here. And you're just going to follow the path that has the most footprints. It's kind of marked a little bit, but it's also a little bit of a choose your own adventure. But we're going straight into the wilderness here for about five, 10 minutes. And keep your eyes open for these posts, which mark the beginning of the El Dorado wagon road. And we're going to make a right here onto the old wagon road, which dates back to the 1860s. And you can see it at points it does get overgrown, but generally it's pretty easy to follow. It's generally straight. This was the old wagon road that ran between California and the El Dorado Canyon, which was famous because there were a bunch of Civil War deserters who came here to mine. And you can still go there. I think there's a little ghost town you can visit in Nelson. Watch out for the Hoya cactus or cacti on the overgrown sections. They can uh, be really painful to get out if you brush against them. Now, if you've ever visited Joshua Tree National Park, you know it can get really crowded. It's rare that you're alone with the trees. Here in Weethump today, I'm the only person here. I've been here several times over the years. I've never seen anyone else here. So if you want alone time with the trees, this is the place. You might have also noticed it's very dense here. There's a ton of Joshua trees, unlike the National Park, Joshua Tree National Park. Uh, that's because this is one of the densest Joshua tree forests in the world. We have them here and just west of here in Mojave National Preserve. Now, when they created this national monument, it also provided an important wildlife and habitat corridor between Mojave National Preserve in the west and Lake Mead uh, National Recreation Area in the east. We Thump is home to some of the oldest Joshua trees in the world, with some of them being 700 to 800 years old. So to put that in perspective, that's just when the Renaissance was starting in Europe. So when these guys were growing out of the grounds, the Renaissance was starting. Pretty amazing. And if you're wondering, Joshua trees have allegedly been around for 2.5 million years, but unfortunately, they are threatened by climate change. Joshua Tree National Park is supposed to be devoid of Joshua trees by the year 2100. This area is a little bit more hospitable to Joshua trees, which is why we have this dense, tense forest here. When you feel like turning around, just go ahead and turn around. It's basically just this wagon road with Joshua trees on it. But you can go all the way uh, to the end, to the eastern boundary of the park. And if you get there, get to the road, make the right on the road. And if you walk for a little bit, you'll come down to the old abandoned ranch, which is worth a look around. Now, even if you don't hike all the way down here, if you turn around before, you can still drive up the road to the ranch and check it out. Definitely worth it if you're here. This ranch is a clue as to what was here before this was a national monument. 
Now, obviously, indigenous people lived here for thousands of years. In the 1800s, you have European Americans coming from um, the east and settling out here, creating ranches, doing mining. It was like that until about 2004 when the Bureau of Land Management bought a lot of the area that is the National Monument now. Now, if you're not familiar with the BLM, they're able to lease the land. And there were a bunch of energy projects that uh, were attempted here, a solar array, a wind farm. They even wanted to dump nuclear waste here. But the local tribes, I think led by the Mojave, uh, fought back. And not only did they fight back, but they put a coalition together of people who loved this area. And it's it's pretty broad. It's bipartisan. It includes hunting groups, OHV groups, you know, conservation groups. And they fought back and they fought to make this a national monument. In 2023, it became a national monument and now it is protected from development. So that's a good thing. Uh, the only person who didn't like it I saw was the governor of Nevada who called it, I think, a federal land grab or a federal confiscation, which I found rich considering, you know, the confiscation happened a couple hundred years ago when the land was taken from the indigenous people. But now the indigenous people, the Mojave specifically, help manage this area in conjunction with the federal government so this area is protected and it's uh, here for you to visit your children and hopefully your grandchildren. The next hike we're going to do is in the Bridge Canyon Wilderness in the southern part here. This is called Grapevine Canyon. It's an out and back up along Grapevine Canyon. Along the way in the beginning we're going to see petroglyphs and then if we continue all the way to the end there is a desert waterfall which is pretty pretty cool. The trailhead is pretty massive and there's a primitive bathroom. At the end of the parking lot is the actual beginning of the trail. There's a little interpretive display. And we're just going to hike down into the wash and start hiking uh, up along the wash towards the mountains. Now there's some trail markers down here, but that's about it. There's not a whole lot around there. And you need to stay in the wash because a lot of the areas on the sides are being restored. So. Just stay down in this area and head towards the V, the beginning of Grapevine Canyon, straight ahead. Now when you get to the entrance of the canyon, look up to your left and right, and you will see lots of petroglyphs. These petroglyphs are believed to be about a thousand years old, and the really good ones are up on the sides here. Now obviously we're not going to touch these, but you can walk up on the sides and take a look. And there's also some down at uh, ground level where you can look and explore and there are some of these ones just sort of hidden where you wouldn't expect it i've probably seen hundreds of petroglyphs over my years hiking and it never stops being cool what do these things mean no one really knows there's speculation that certain symbols mean certain things like a spiral or a circle is part of a creation story a, a human form with genitalia is human and without genitalia is a god but these are just ideas one thing i can tell you is that a petroglyph is carved in the rock and a pictograph is painted on the rock here at grapevine these are all petroglyphs these are all carved in the rocks and obviously you need to be respectful not touch them Let's take pictures uh, bring home memories if you want to continue up the canyon which i highly recommend doing because it's not too tough you're going to go basically follow the canyon up and it's going to split apart quite a bit you can see here it's split there's not really one defined trail it changes and the workflow is to go up until uh, you can't go anymore. So some of these trails, like you look at this one on the right, sort of peters out. You could scramble up those boulders. But if you look to the left, there's definitely an easier path through here. And we're going to go up along the wash still. One of the things I love about this, aside from these massive boulders, pieces of granite that you're going to share it with, is looking up on the sides of the canyon because there's all of these hoodoos and different rock formations that make it really, really beautiful. It almost feels surreal. There is a natural spring here in the canyon, and that's why it's so lush. And there's also actually grapevines growing here as well, hence the name Grapevine Canyon. Now, continuing up, you're going to come to this area of steep granite that looks impassable. You can go up and around on the left-hand side, and there's a path up and around, or you can just kind of climb up the granite slabs here, it's not too hard. It's usually easier to come down on the uh, path, but go up on the granite. But once you get to the top, the views are pretty cool, and you can see down to that boulder that we were looking up at earlier. Some sections can be overgrown. It all depends on the season and when you're visiting and 
how wet it's been, but you can see here we have to pick our way through some of this overgrowth, but the trail, if you look down, is very easy to find and follow and continue on. Let's quickly talk about when to visit and what to bring. So this is obviously the desert. In the summertime, it gets hot here, deadly hot, and you don't want to visit then. Wintertime is beautiful. It's the Mojave Desert, so it's a higher altitude desert. It gets nice and cool in the winter and the early spring. That's a great time to go. Regardless of when you visit, you're going to want to have sun protection because the sun is pretty relentless out here. These hikes are pretty exposed. Bring one liter of water for each one of these. You don't really need any kind of special hike hiking gear. I definitely would bring the essentials with you because we are in the back country. If you have a satellite communicator, it will help because the cell phone reception is spotty, if not non-existent. But otherwise, just like light hiking gear or fitness clothes and a good trail runner, I think will do really well here. If you want to know what gear I'm currently using, I keep an updated list on my gear page. Just search for hiking guy, best hiking gear. There's nothing promoted on there, no sponsorships. It's just gear that I buy, I test, and uh, only the good stuff that I actually use and recommend gets onto that page. All right, let's continue on up the canyon, admiring all of the views up around us. Once again, the canyon's beautiful, but if you look up around you, it's also quite beautiful. Here we are over the last big slab of granite, and once again, the views that open up the peaks around us, just breathtaking. Now, Part of this hike is gonna be going up along the wash, and usually you can just follow the footprints or there'll be multiple paths up the wash, but that's your best move to look for the footprints. You can see how green it is here. Like we're in the middle of the Mojave Desert and look how green it is. And there's trees and grasses and all kinds of things that you wouldn't expect to see here in the Mojave. Now at this point, there's a canyon straight ahead or you can do this little cut around to the left. I'd recommend coming back on this cut around, but if you go up the canyon, and this is like a small canyon here, but it's really, really weather-worn, beautiful, incredible. As you go up, it'll start to get a little bit more narrow and we'll climb out of it at the end, but I just wanted to show you what this looks like. You can see here it's starting to narrow, but definitely navigable. And as we get towards the end, there's gonna be a place to climb up, which is right in front of us here. You can climb up on this and you can see there's little areas you can use as a foothold as you climb up. Because if you continue past here, it just gets a little bit too narrow. And once you climb up there and you look down, you can see that's a little bit tougher to climb out. Or you could take the path around it. And if you do, you'll come out, we'll go up the wash just a little bit more and we'll come towards the end of the canyon. And the waterfall's just around this big boulder. We're going to hook around this big boulder to the right here, go down, and then look up to the left, and you will see the waterfall. Now this, again, water in the desert, such a cool place. And you can kind of scale up along the granite. Obviously, be careful. But even just checking it out from down here, you're getting the bulk of it. It's still really, really beautiful. And obviously a good place to spot some wildlife. There's always some birds here and maybe we'll even see like a bighorn sheep. And thank you to everyone who supports the channel. It allows me to do videos like this without ads in it. So thank you, thank you, thank you. I cannot do it without you. If you'd like to say thank you for the video, you can give me a little thumbs up as well. Last hike I'm gonna show you is in the Spirit Mountain Wilderness in the southeast of the park. We're gonna drive up to Christmas Tree Pass and then from there, hike up to a small saddle where we're going to get some incredible views of Spirit Mountain from the back. This is a view you don't normally get here. Now, the drive to the trailhead is part of the fun. You can do it in a low clearance vehicle, but if you have a high clearance vehicle or 4x4, it should be much easier. But I've seen, I've seen Priuses and all kinds of different cars up here. You just have to go a little bit slower if you don't have the clearance, but it's definitely doable. When you get up to the parking lot area, there's a small parking lot. And this is called Christmas Tree Pass because for some reason people put Christmas tree ornaments in the juniper trees here. I wouldn't recommend doing that. I don't think it's in fashion anymore, but you do uh, or you can see some of them up in the trees still. 
Now you can hike to the top of Spirit Mountain. I did it many years ago before I really understood the spiritual significance of it. Since then, I've talked with local tribe members. Some of them say it's okay to hike to the top. Uh, just be respectful. It's a spiritual place. Others have said they prefer if hikers didn't visit there. Having done that trail before, it's very narrow, very hard to follow, a lot of scrambling, not just a normal hike to do, uh, but more of a scramble, almost climbing exercise. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to hike up to a viewpoint where we can do it in a safe and respectful way. The start of the hike is easy to spot at the end of the parking lot. You'll see all these signs here. At one point, I think you could ride motorcycles in here, but now it's a wilderness area, so there's no motorized vehicles allowed. We're going to go up this big wide road, maybe an old mining road or something. And as you go up, if you look up ahead, you'll see a little gap there. That's the saddle where we're going to go to get those unique views of the back of Spirit Mountain. Now, as you hike up, you're going to look for a small side trail off to the right. And you can see there's a little rock pile, a little cairn there marking it. This is a wet year. It's really overgrown. It's usually a little bit easier to spot here. But you can see if you continue through, there's a small trail. It's not as wide as the one we were just on, but it's definitely there. If you know how to follow a GPX file, I have that file on the website. You can go check that out. It makes it a little bit easier to follow. But even if not, if you look down, uh, there's definitely a trail. You can see there's a trail here. Lots of great wildflowers right now in the spring. After about a half a mile, you're going to come up to the viewpoint where you can really enjoy these incredible views of Spirit Mountain and uh, just soak it all in and then just head back the way you came to your car. If you want to do some other hikes close to Las Vegas, check out my video on Red Rock Canyon. It is like a mini national park and it's only minutes away from the Strip.